There once was a time in the long, long ago when there was... This is a scene from Disney's Oscar-winning film, The Goddess of Spring. Released in 1934, the nine-minute short pushed the boundaries of animation with its lush visuals, operatic storytelling, and most importantly, its realistic depiction of the human form. Prior to this, human characters were shapeless figures with giant heads and noodle arms. Any attempts at realistic proportions tumbled straight into the uncanny valley. But Goddess of Spring was the first to capture both the weight and the elegance of a human body moving through its surroundings. Mostly. It's not perfect. The arms are still pretty rubbery, and she still has a tenuous relationship to gravity, but imagine what it must have been like for audiences barely acquainted with color film to see a moving painting rendered with such three-dimensional beauty. Then imagine going back to the theater just three years later, and seeing this. I'm William H. Amazing, and you're watching There Will Be Fud. Snow White was not the first feature-length cartoon. That honor belongs, at least among surviving works, to Lottie Reiniger's silhouette masterpiece The Adventures of Prince Ahmed. But it's often regarded as the first because it pioneered so many of the techniques that are still used to this day. From its dazzling color palette to its dizzying multiplane camera shots, it established a template that would remain unchallenged until the CGI boom six decades later. Essentially, every cell-animated film released by a major studio during that period followed Snow White's mold, though few would ever match its technical wizardry. The film's success reflects this. Dubbed Disney's Folly during production, it quickly trounced expectations, becoming the highest-grossing picture of its era and still remaining one of the most profitable films ever made. It was the first to have a commercially released soundtrack, the first to successfully merchandise its characters, it won an adorable honorary Oscar, and it was named by the American Film Institute as the greatest animated movie of all time. So in short, its legacy is cemented, and the last thing it needs is another dude on the internet gushing about how innovative it was. Nevertheless, since Disney's renaissance in the 90s, there's been a pushback among younger viewers to remove Snow White from her throne. They point to her lack of agency and thinly developed romance, saying the world no longer has a need for such oversimplified fluff. And they make a good case. The emergence of progressive female protagonists in search of something deeper than true love's kiss doesn't leave much room for the blink-and-you'll-miss-it courtship of Snow White and her unnamed prince. And with films like Enchanted and Frozen making winky meta-commentary about these outdated morals, it seems like even Disney is ready to retire Snow White and declare a new princess fairest of them all. But there's a difference between a film not aging well and an audience refusing to meet it on its own terms. And I feel like the most common complaints lobbed against Snow White tend to be based on misguided expectations that the film has no business trying to fill. Here's an example. Let's say one of your problems with the film is that you find Snow White's voice annoying. You say her singing is warbly and childish, and you therefore have a harder time getting behind the character than you do Belle or Ariel. Now I could say that you're being unfair, because Snow White was based on popular singers of the time. Coquettish soprano starlets were all the rage in the 30s, so the film was just giving audiences what they wanted. But this doesn't make the criticism any less valid. It's still a dated vocal style with no natural warmth, which Disney could have anticipated was too specific to last. So while it might be easy enough to forgive, it is still a dent in the film's overall quality. On the other hand, let's say that your complaint is that the songs themselves aren't as good as those that would come during the Renaissance era. You say the Broadway-inspired ballads pack an emotional heft that puts Snow White's twinkly little jingles to shame. Now this may also be true, but it's not really a criticism because Snow White isn't trying to be a big Broadway musical. Powerhouse audition pieces like that didn't exist in the 30s, and if they had, they'd be wildly out of place in a minimalist fairy tale rooted in gothic horror and German expressionism. Apart from the common thread of princesses, Snow White is an entirely separate genre of film from those that would follow, with completely different aesthetic goals. Just imagine the gentle atmosphere and delicate visuals of this scene being bombarded by a shameless mezzo belt about finding yourself. Snow 
Snow White's songs can't be called inferior because they're perfectly suited to the tone and pacing of the film they're in, and they're obviously catchy enough that we're still singing them 80 years later. Now, you may prefer the more modern songs, and that's fine, they're written to appeal to modern tastes, but it is a question of taste and not quality. The existence of Frozen isn't any more of a knock against Snow White than the existence of Hamilton is against the Lion King. And if you look at the entire film through this lens, you'll find very little that doesn't hold up. We'll start with the story. Most grim adaptations have had to add characters and backstories to fill their runtime, but here Walt stripped away all but the most essential plot points of the fairy tale. Part of the reason was to make room for gags. Cartoons up to this point held only enough story to get the characters from one comic set piece to the next, and there was little expectation that the film would infuse anything deeper into this formula. In fact, the first question most reporters asked when Snow White was announced was whether it would feature Mickey Mouse. So naturally, Walt was going to structure the film around the strengths of his animators and allow for long portions of mostly silent comedy. Similarly, removing dialogue and excess characters allowed the film a more visual focus, with fewer distractions from the breathtaking backgrounds of the forest, the long passageways through the castle, or the intricate hand-carved ornaments in the dwarf's cottage. Most impressive are the elaborate special effects sequences. The Queen's transformation was far superior to the best horror movies of its time, or any time for that matter, at least until Rick Baker recycled some of Disney's techniques in the 80s. Likewise, Snow White's escape through the woods employs some of the most effective nightmare imagery ever seen in a children's film. The looming shadows and mysterious sounds of the forest gave the animators so much to work with that they returned to the set piece again, and again, and again, and still had to leave some of their best ideas on the cutting room floor. There are few people who would dispute the film's technical merit, so we won't spend too much time on them. The question is whether it relies too heavily on visuals, artwork, and slapstick at the expense of story. Walt's original pitch was much closer to the plot-heavy live-action version he'd seen as a child, but as time went on, he cut away more and more loose story threads to make room for scenes like... this. A four-minute song about absolutely nothing that cost more than anything else in the entire film. Oh, hum, the tune is not the worst of me to think. But just because there's nothing happening doesn't mean there's not a story being told. As a kid, I always assumed this scene was set about a month after Snow White moved in. I even thought that the skeleton in the witch's dungeon was the huntsman who had been imprisoned for his treachery, and that enough time had passed for him to die of thirst and deteriorate inside his cell. It wasn't until I got older that I realized this all takes place within just a few hours of Snow White's arrival at the cottage. There was something so tender about the affection the dwarves show her, so genuine about the joy she brings into their lives, that it really felt like seven individual relationships had been developed off-screen. I liked how Bashful had grown just a little more confident around her, how Grumpy is still kinda pissed but willing to play along, how without anything to do but be merry, the group's de facto leader becomes happy instead of Doc. There's no dialogue to support these changes, just minor gestures and expressions, but they feel true because they build on what's already been established. And this is how the film does most of its storytelling. Scenes that seem to be lacking in plot are used to develop the characters through visual subtext, so that when the story does eventually move forward, there's no question as to how we got there. As animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson observed, we quickly learned that a drab retelling of any story or an emphasis on continuity and exposition was the wrong way to go. Nothing is more deadly in animation than explanation of who the characters are and what they're doing there, followed by more discussion of what they're going to do about it. So if you need the Huntsman to take Snow White into the woods to execute her, you can either force him some excuse for why she'd go with him, or you can simply establish early on that she's inherently trusting and compliant, and then cut straight to the two of them out picking flowers. We'll fill in the rest ourselves. You don't need plot in every scene so long as we believe the characters and understand their motivations. So let's talk character. Snow White. Snow White. I'm Snow White. Snow White! The princess? So obviously Snow White can't be accused of copying Disney princess tropes because she's the one who invented them. And actually, Disney princesses weren't really a thing until the 90s. 
Cinderella was made because the studio ran out of money after the war and needed a guaranteed hit, so they said, well, Snow White was successful, let's just do that again. Then they had enough discarded ideas from both films to string together Sleeping Beauty, but when critics called out the similarities, they moved on from princesses and pretty much abandoned fairy tales altogether. And that was it. There have been twice as many princesses just in the last ten years as there were during Walt's entire lifetime, to say nothing of parodies and live-action remakes. So whenever these films bend over backwards to correct classic Disney tropes, You mean to tell me you got engaged to someone you just met that day? What they're really targeting is one successful film and two direct imitations. It would be like if 50 years from now, every other Pixar film was about toys and they were all crammed with meta-jokes about the limited worldview of those original toy movies. Or like if several decades after the Star Wars trilogy, we suddenly had a new Star Wars movie every year, and each one desperately catered to any slight criticism that had been made about the ones before. But if there is one thing missing from Snow White's narrative, it's this. In almost every musical ever written, there's a place that's usually about the third song of the evening. Sometimes it's the second, sometimes it's the fourth, but it's quite early. And the leading lady usually sits down on something. Sometimes it's a tree stump in Brigadoon. Sometimes it's um, under the pillars of Covent Garden in My Fair Lady, or it's a trash can in Little Shop of Horrors. But the leading lady sits down on something and sings about what she wants in life. And the audience falls in love with her and then roots for her to get it for the rest of the night. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? We call this the I Want song, and every Disney musical since The Little Mermaid has one. The characters express a goal, become part of your world, have adventure in the great wide somewhere, spend one day out there, go the distance. Then an outside force gives them the means to achieve this goal, but they still have to take the initiative themselves. Snow White, on the other hand, does not have an I Want song. She has an I Wish song. I'm wishing. She's not working to achieve her dreams, she's waiting for them to happen to her. And this is where Snow White loses some people, because her dream is that someday her prince will come, but her goal that drives the story is simply to survive. And on the surface, these two motivations don't have anything to do with each other. But this is another place where we have to put the film in the right context. Let's put a pin in that. People like modern Disney protagonists for their complexity, which Snow White doesn't really have. At the start of the film, she's cheery, hardworking, and gullible, and by the end, she's cheery, hardworking, and gullible. Nowadays, audiences expect the hero to dig a little deeper. They can't just have growth, they need a desire that's specific to their identity. Often the desire is to discover that identity, but no matter what, it's tied into who they are and how they're different from society. The reason for this is that identity has been at the center of most social justice issues over the last 30 years. Be it a question of race, class, gender, or orientation, there's been a growing demand among marginalized communities to decide for themselves who they are and how they fit into the world. As a result, modern viewers are drawn to characters who reject easy categorization and yearn for more than society has been willing to give them. It's not a coincidence that the lyricist who launched the Disney Renaissance was a soon-to-be victim of the AIDS crisis at a time when the government was deliberately withholding treatment. The underlying message of his songs isn't, people are special, it's people have specific needs, and society rejecting those needs is literally killing them. We don't like what we don't understand, in fact it scares us, and this monster is mysterious at least. And the influence of these films is part of the reason that identity remains so prominent in media targeted at younger viewers. Howard Ashman inspired millennials to be proud of whatever sets them apart, and if they haven't figured out what that is, they can at least be proud of which Hogwarts house they belong to. My point here is that if you grew up with these films, you probably take it for granted that any three-dimensional protagonist will undergo some sort of identity crisis. But self-discovery is just one type of character arc, and not even an inherently heroic one. Elsa letting it go is neither good nor bad for her community until we see what she does next. We knew to root for her in 2013 because we had positive associations with identity liberation at the time, but she could have just as easily been the poster girl for a very different group of suppressed individuals who came out of hiding a few years later. Finding yourself is only admirable if the self you find is good. 
And I don't mean in any way to say that identity issues aren't important or shouldn't be taken seriously. I just mean that this kind of story holds a very specific appeal to the current generation that it wouldn't have had back in 1937. Not because nobody back then had to hide who they were, plenty of people did, but because that particular struggle wasn't at the forefront of the shared cultural conversation. Here's what they were talking about instead. <laughs> The 1930s were a miserable, miserable time to be alive, and America was not immune. The Depression had left a quarter of the country out of work, the Dust Bowl had devastated the nation's farming land, and just when the economy was starting to recover, a second recession hit, spiking the unemployment rate back up to 19% just months before Snow White hit theaters. Meanwhile, Japan was invading China, Spain was caught in a civil war, the Kremlin was executing dissenters by the hundred thousand, and in Germany there was... trouble brewing. So if Disney had tried to lift America's spirits with, say, a cocky non-contributing pickpocket who thinks that being held responsible for criminal behavior makes him misunderstood, he'd have been booed off the screen. Audiences could certainly sympathize with someone who didn't know where his next meal was coming from, but not with his sense of entitlement to be recognized for who he feels he is rather than what he actually does. There's so much more to me. Okay, Sonny, then prove it. Stop treating the world like it's your personal buffet and show us what you bring to the table. Depression-era America didn't need a diamond in the rough, they needed someone who could keep smiling even as death stared them in the face. Someone whose first instinct when they see a problem is to fix it. Someone who doesn't scoff at authority, but shows proper respect, and offers their service in any way they can. In other words, they needed someone cheery, hardworking, and at least a little gullible. For all her delicacy, Snow White is the epitome of American strength and resilience. A carefully constructed super soldier here to guide the nation through its darkest hour. We've seen so many free-spirited princesses whistling their problems away that we've forgotten why this trope came about in the first place. Snow White doesn't sing because there's a song in her heart, she does it to endure the horrors that surround her. What do you do when things go wrong? She doesn't clean for the dwarves because she considers it her womanly duty. She does it because she wants something from them and doesn't expect to get it for free. We'll clean the house and surprise them. Then maybe they'll let me stay. She doesn't have animal friends just following her around for no reason like some manic woodland dream girl. She earns their trust by putting on a brave face even at her lowest moment. She's just discovered that she has no home, no friends, and her only family wants to murder her, and yet within minutes she wipes away her tears, apologizes for being afraid, and begins looking for ways to start over. And all because I was afraid. I'm so ashamed of the fuss I made. And she's rewarded for this. First with companions, then with a home, with new friends, with the death of her enemy, and finally with her dream coming true. In Snow White, we see the origin of the entire Disney philosophy. Good triumphs over evil. Not because we want it to, because it had to. Because audiences needed to know that a world turned upside down will eventually be righted, as long as they keep their chins up and work together towards that better day. And here's where Snow White not only stands the test of time, but surpasses every modern Disney protagonist. Because unlike self-discovery, hard work and optimism are always going to be good lessons. See, I could have titled this video, Why Snow White is the Princess We Need in 2020, and talked about how she's the only one who wouldn't be throwing off her mask and sneaking out to parties every five minutes, but that fails to capture just how timeless her values really are. Sure, she won't inspire any teens to come out to their parents, but she might help them cope with a loss of a parent. Or a job or whatever hard times may come. And she doesn't need to upend societal norms to do so because her message is already clear. Be brave, work hard, wish for a better life, and someday it will come. It's crucial to Snow White's arc that she doesn't change. That she can lose everything, be driven through hell, fall down at death's door, and still wake up holding tight to that good old American dream. 
She may not show much agency, but to call this a requirement only limits our definition of what a strong female character can be. It ignores the fact that most women in history didn't have the option to control their own destinies, and implies that unless you single-handedly push your entire gender forward, you don't deserve to have your story told. But often, the best indicator of strength isn't whether you reject your circumstances, but how you choose to live with them. With a smile and a song, perhaps. With a smile and a song. All right, let's talk about the prince. Here's the most important thing to remember when watching this film. The prince is not a character. I don't mean he's a bad character, or that he has no character. I mean he is not a player in this story. At least not an important one. He's like the doctor who takes Blanche away at the end of Streetcar. He exists to close out the protagonist's narrative, but that's really all we need to know about him. I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. He's a prince. You want to marry the prince. Disney didn't invent that. He's a visual shorthand for Snow White's dream coming true as a reward for all that she's endured. And yes, we all know it's not ideal for the hero to be rewarded with a lover, but Disney is far from the worst perpetrator there. If you save the world, we can do it in the asshole. If you're telling a love story, you need a pair of distinct yet complementary characters who can be molded together in a satisfying way. But if you're telling a murder story, where the love interest exists solely to be a light at the end of the survivor's tunnel, you really just need to show that he's not another monster. Snow White is a fantasy first, a horror movie second, a musical third, a comedy fourth, and a romance fifth at best. It's often parodied as the film where the heroine just sits around waiting for her prince to come, but watch it again. She barely mentions him for the entire runtime. Far from depending on a man, there are long stretches of the film where he doesn't even cross her mind. Walt could have tried to craft a fleshed out relationship with a balanced power dynamic that developed slowly over several scenes, but it's probably best he didn't attempt this in an era where screenwriters weren't known for their enlightened gender politics. Instead, he opted for age-old motifs, like wishing wells, far-off castles, and love at first sight. Not the most progressive ideas, but we return to them again and again because anyone from anywhere at any time will appreciate their meaning. If the film seems simplistic, it's because it chose to shed any elements that wouldn't meet this universal standard. If anything, it deserves credit for keeping the prince on the sidelines so there's never any doubt that Snow White can carry the story without him. And while you can also achieve this by eliminating romance altogether, as in Disney's recent string of platonic buddy quests, absence of libido does not by itself a strong character make. The long-term message we're now teaching kids is that if they give even the slightest thought to romance without applying a comprehensive and mature understanding of adult courtship, their expectations will inevitably betray them. But ask yourself if any five-year-old is going to interpret this ending as literal relationship advice. The prince is a symbol. He's not underdeveloped any more than the castle is underdeveloped. It's not his story, and you don't have to read any further than the title to know that. An early production memo to the animators made it clear where the heart of the film would lie. Rather than spend too much of our energy at the present time in working out the first and less important sequences, Walt prefers to start actual work at the point where Snow White finds the cottage of the Seven Dwarfs. Disney's version was the first to give the dwarves names to match their personalities, narrowed down from a list of over 60 initial suggestions to the seven we know today. I said I wouldn't dwell on technical merits, but it's worth noting just how rare of a feat this was for an animated film. Before Snow White, if you wanted a group of matching characters, you just copied the same design until the screen was full. Even nowadays, it's rare to see more than two light characters with any individuality. You'll see different voices and maybe different heights, but from a design standpoint, they're basically clones. But suddenly, here were seven personalities, similar in appearance, but completely distinct in demeanor, posture, and physicality. When something surprises them, we see seven different reactions, and the film makes a game of restaging them in each scene so our eyes have to race across the screen to track them down. They fall in love with Snow White not as a unit, but each in their own way and on their own time, changing their habits for her, showing off for her, crying for her, 
and even killing for her. It's the dwarves who chase the queen to her death, rather than the execution ordered by the prince in the grim story. It's the dwarves whom we watch as Snow White sings about her dreams, not the fantasy sequence that was originally planned. It's the dwarves breaking down in tears at her funeral that floored audiences in 1937. Disney's folly instantly vindicated by the star-studded crowd who wept together at the premiere. And if you've gotta have that sweet rom-com juice, it's the dwarves who deliver. One dwarf in particular. Oh, you must be grumpy. <laughs> While the other dwarves' infatuations land somewhere between parental protection and hot for teacher, Grumpy is played as a genuine romantic prospect, one who occupies Snow White's thoughts far more than the prince ever does. Why, Grumpy, you do care. We know the story's not actually going to bring them together, and therefore don't have to consider the thornier ramifications of their age gap or housing circumstances, but we still get that nice, meaty relationship arc full of broken prejudices, humble egos, and hard-earned mutual respect. In fact, there are times when the film almost seems to be hinting that Grumpy's been the man on her mind all along. Listen to the way she dodges questions during Someday My Prince Will Come. Was he, uh, strong and handsome? Was he big and tall? There's nobody like him. Anywhere at all. This song, by the way, is the only overt reference she makes to the prince until the last ten minutes of the film. She sings it twice. Once here. Mush. And once here. The only other time she acknowledges the existence of the prince is this vague mention of him in her prayers. And may my dreams come true. But take a wild guess who she prays for next. Oh yes, and please make Grumpy like me. Of course, that's not the ending we get. But again, this is really more of a symbolic epilogue, one that audiences in 1937 wouldn't have taken at face value. A girl who's known nothing but hardship is released from her burdens by a silent figure on a white horse and carried away to a glowing castle in the sky. It's not a stretch to say that a generation who watched their loved ones work themselves to death would have found a deeper meaning here than happily ever after. But by any narrative standpoint, the film's big moment of catharsis isn't here. It's here. This is where we find out how far the story has taken us. This is where we realize how much we truly care. And it's not the prince or even Snow White who brings us here, but a character so one-dimensional, his defining personality trait is carved into his bed. One character in a set of seven, who would have no business being the emotional center of any other film, but who, through the magic of animation, achieves unprecedented levels of warmth and pathos, and turns a six-page fairy tale into one of the most cherished movies of all time. I won't argue that Snow White is perfect, or that it has a hidden feminist agenda, or that a group of white men on the verge of a capitalist empire weren't subject to the prejudices of their time. Hell, the last dwarf name to get cut from the shortlist was Deffy. And there are plenty of elements in the finished product that don't work. Doc Spoonerisms get kind of old after a while, the handwashing scene is pretty pointless, Snow White's mouth doesn't always line up perfectly, these silent movie title cards come kinda out of nowhere, but for every minor blemish, there are a dozen radiant beauty marks. The shine of the diamonds, the shimmer of the running river, the shadows cast by a single candle flame, the disturbingly featureless face of the magic mirror. The film is a goldmine of aesthetic pleasures from a team whose business model was to push animation as far as it could go and then keep pushing. Compare this to films from DreamWorks, where every character has the same rotation of facial expressions, and the voice actors clearly recorded their lines in a single session without ever reading the script. I go in a booth, and I go, uh, oh, what's the line? And the guy goes, it's time to go to the store. And then I go, it's time to go to the store! <laughs> or even Pixar, whose storytelling techniques, while heart-wrenching, haven't really evolved much since 1995. Then look at how far Disney flew in the three years after Goddess of Spring, and it's just impossible not to feel exhilarated. 
Like the boundaries of animation truly are limitless, and like even today there's nothing to stop us from creating something just as groundbreaking. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute. See, sometimes innovation is a novelty. Films like The Jazz Singer or Gertie the Dinosaur that showed audiences something they'd never seen before but don't hold much more than historical interest today. But innovation can also be a basin, a brewing ground for young artists to challenge each other, let their ideas melt together or explode in a hundred different directions. And this raw, human energy bursting through every frame is the reason audiences continue to fall in love with Snow White generation after generation. There's real mirth here and wonder and excitement at the emergence of something completely new, and that still shines through even if you know nothing about the film's impact or legacy. We're watching Snow White, and they love it. So no, Snow White's not a great movie simply because it made Clark Gable cry, or because it earned an obscene amount of money, or because the entire future of animation was dependent on its success, because none of that answers the question of whether it still holds up 83 years later. But a more relevant question might be whether modern Disney films will hold up 83 years from now. Will people hum how far I'll go on their morning commute? Will children be able to name all the members of the Big Hero 6? Will an act of sisterly love still feel like a bold subversion of fairy tale tropes? Or will these be forgotten relics that you make your grandkids sit through and struggle to remember why you once held them in such high regard? But tough little Snow White will still be around. She's a survivor, and she'll continue to enchant us for the same reason she always has. Because she's beautiful, and kind, and hard as nails. So after all this time, could it be that Disney's first film remains their best? Are its achievements unmatched by any that would follow? Is Snow White still the fairest of them all? No. Not really. It's great and all, but Disney was constantly innovating, and there were plenty more masterpieces to come. If I were to make a ranking of every Disney animated feature, I'd put Snow White right about... here. Yeah. There. Near the top, certainly, but not the best. Ah. But which films surpass it, you ask? Well. You'll have to watch the next... 57 videos to find out. I hope you brought a snack.